So I teach, yeah, I teach history of religions, I teach uh, philosophy and modern art. You know, literature, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of literature. Um, so my talk is about crucifixion, crucifixion in 20th century painting. Uh, and he, here is basically what I'm going to do. Um, I will briefly give you some uh, historical background. Um, and uh, then I move on to the 20th century. And in the 20th century, I will follow uh, the succession of modern art movements. Uh, I will give you examples of crucifixions that come from uh, um, 20th century expressionism, uh, cubism, um, surrealism, abstraction, and postmodernism. And then I will conclude with my own thesis, so to say. But um, uh, as for the thesis, my, my thesis is actually um, as follows. Uh, in the history of uh, Christian art, there were three types of crucifixions. Uh, the first one uh, may be called uh, a Byzantine crucifixion. The second one, uh, the Catholic crucifixion. They, they correspond basically to um, the uh, progress of Christianity or to the development of Christianity throughout the ages. The third one uh, was um, related to the Renaissance. Uh, so the Renaissance crucifixion. Uh, and then my thesis is that in the 19th and the 20th century, uh, we witness um, the um, invention of the fourth type of crucifixion, what I would call modern existential uh, or modern existentialist, uh, not to be confused with existentialism as a philosophical movement. Uh, and um, by giving examples um, of um, Cubist, expressionist, uh, surrealist, abstract, and postmodern crucifixions, I will try to show you what kind of crucifixion we are dealing with. So let me begin with some um, historical background. Um, as you know, crucifixion uh, is the central uh, event in Christianity. Uh, what distinguishes Christianity from other religions is the uniqueness of Jesus' mediation. Jesus as the unique mediator between the divine and the human realm. So Christianity, unlike uh, some other religions, for example, Judaism and Islam, uh, Christianity is not, about, um, is not only about the teaching of Jesus, but it is also about his life, his death and resurrection. So usually when I uh, discuss with my students this topic, I ask them, what, what if you... Um, change something in Judaism and Islam? What if it is not Moses, but uh, someone else who delivers the law? Would this, would this change Judaism? And the answer is no. Because um, to be a Jew, to be a good Jew means to follow the law. The same in Islam. Uh, to be a good Muslim means to believe that Muhammad is God's prophet and to follow the law. Uh, Christianity is different. It's not only about what you believe, uh, but it's, uh, it's about uh, this unique mediation that was delivered by Jesus. Um, it's, it's, not about, it's not only about what he taught, but how he lived. So, but the, the thing is that in the Roman Empire, crucifixion was the capital punishment that was reserved for the worst criminals. And therefore, Christians found themselves in a rather uh, ambiguous situation when they followed the person uh, who was believed to be criminal. So therefore, um, they um, did not emphasize in their art crucifixion. So th this is the earliest crucifixion um, that we uh, know of uh, that dates back to the fifth century. So they, they may have been uh, earlier crucifixions, maybe. Uh, but still, this is the first one we know of, and it's interesting that uh, it comes from the 5th century, the 5th century uh, being a decisive uh, century for Christianity. Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire by the end of the 4th century. So Christianity was legalized. It was okay to produce that kind of art. Um, so that's one thing. And, and the second thing to notice, if you look at Jesus here, uh, he is very different from how uh, he would be portrayed later on. Uh, he is uh, muscular. He is uh, young. Uh, his eyes are wide open. Uh, so there is no um, sense of uh, humiliation, defeat, suffering, death, you know, those kind of things that would later appear in crucifixions. So that's how it all started. 
Bless you. Now, uh, to the Byzantine crucifixion. This is my example of a Byzantine crucifixion, a mosaic in the monastery church in Daphne in Greece, uh, 11th century. So as I said, um, uh, there are three types of crucifixion that arise in the history of the Christian church. This is the first one. Uh, it is uh, Byzantine because it was developed mainly in the Byzantine Empire that survived um, after uh, the western part of the empire fell to the barbarians in the fifth century. And um, it gives us a sense of the combination of uh, classical uh, art and uh, Christian supernaturalism that would be characteristic of the Byzantine art. And plus, uh, in Byzantium, uh, this kind of art still retains uh, the characteristics of a devotional object. You know, the difference between Christian art in the East and Christian art in the West um, is that in the East, uh, it uh, is still an object of devotion. And today in Orthodox churches, uh, they use icons as devotional objects, as the mirror uh, to heaven. Um, in the West, uh, Christian art was developed basically for the purposes of education. People could not read, and therefore they, have to be, they had to be educated in their own religion. So when you enter the church, you see all those uh, uh, artistic depictions, and you basically learn from them. Uh, but uh, it was, again, more educational, less uh, devotional. Uh, this is uh, uh, my example of the second type of crucifixion, which is the Catholic crucifixion. Um, now, relatively infrequent uh, in the first 10 Christian centuries, uh, in the second millennium, uh, crucifixion becomes the central episode of the Passion Cycle and the principal theme of Christian art. So this is medieval or Catholic crucifixion, uh, which is very different from the uh, early crucifixions and from the Byzantine crucifixions. Again, if you compare here, um, if you look at the figure of Jesus, um, although his face is full, full of sorrow, but his eyes are still open. Uh, and uh, the, the overall uh, figure looks like it is uh, airy and, uh, you know, kind of floating in the air. Uh, so there is less emphasis on suffering and death, uh, but more emphasis on resurrection and glory. Uh, and if you compare this with uh, the medieval or Catholic crucifixion, if you look at the face, you see that uh, Jesus' faith is full of suffering and pain. Uh, and that would that, that what medieval crucifixions would uh, emphasize. Uh, pain, suffering, agony, uh, uh, and the reason why they would do this is because Catholic theology would uh, concentrate on uh, the redemptive power uh, of Jesus' death. So redemption comes through suffering and agony, uh, hence the change in crucifixions. Now the third type of crucifixion uh, paintings that arise uh, in the history of uh, the, the Christian um, church and art uh, would uh, be the Renaissance crucifixions. Uh, as you uh, probably know, the Renaissance discovered uh, the perspective, the way to paint in such a way uh, as to see the painting as the mirror to the external world. So three-dimensional perspective, the vanishing point, uh, that is one uh, characteristic feature of re the Renaissance art. The second one is um, a, a newfound interest in history and historical uh, reality of the events. Hence, the two major features of the Renaissance crucifixions. Uh, first, more emphasis on history, on, the, on, on how it really happened, rather than the symbolism of it. And second, um, the three-dimensional per perspective, um, the way the painting is constructed, for example, the vanishing point here is uh, somewhere here, so we see it Jesus who is above us, and we see it the grave who is below us. Uh, this is just another example of a Renaissance uh, crucifixion uh, by Raphael, and here I uh, wanted to point out uh, the fact that uh, even in the Renaissance, um, even in the West, when uh, crucifixion, well, when, um, where Christian art um, was used for educational purposes, not for devotional purposes, even here we still have traditional Christian symbolism uh, 
uh, in the painting. Uh, for example, the sun and the moon are the symbols of Christ's sovereignty. Um, uh, what else? Angels. Uh, th these are the witnesses to crucifixion: John the Apostle and Mary, the mother, uh, the mother of Jesus. Um, in some paintings, there will be uh, centurions here, the Roman soldiers, and the Pharisees. Uh, so we we still have the symbolism, um, according to which, if you see the lion, uh, the lion would be the symbol of uh, Jesus's uh, resurrection and ascension. The lion and the eagle, resurrection and ascension. If you see the serpent, that would be the symbol of um, the, the, the Satan and the sin. Uh, so sun and the moon, uh, the symbols of Christ's sovereignty, uh, the tree of life is the symbol of salvation, etc. Now, before we move on to the 20th century, just a couple of examples uh, of pre-20th century crucifixions that um, uh, are very important uh, for 20th century artists that uh, um, exerted major influence on 20th century artists. This is one of them. Uh, crucifixion by Grunewald. Uh, very famous for uh, the hands. Uh, that would be used in German Expressionism as well as in some other paintings. Uh, this is El Greco, Christ on the Cross, cross um, which is in Louvre. And let me tell you, I've been in Louvre, and I looked at this painting, and it's not gray, it's dark blue. <laughs> so let me... Uh, point out, uh, it's actually dark blue, and it's, uh, that makes a difference. And Paul Gauguin, another influence on 20th century artists, especially on postmodernists. Um, uh, postmodernists would, uh, you know, um, be interested in the issues of identity uh, and, and uh, would conflate Christ with primitive culture. So th this is one of the prototypes of those kind of crucifixions. So now we move on to the 20th century. And as I told you, my thesis is that uh, the 19th and the 20th century, and especially the 20th century, um, in the 20th century, we see the rise of a new type of crucifixion. It's neither Byzantine, nor Catholic, nor Renaissance. It can be called modern. It can be called modern existential. Uh, again, not to confuse with uh, existentialism as a philosophical movement. And the main features of uh, this type of crucifixion is that it becomes um, disassociated with uh, Christian theology and Christian ideology, and sometimes even with Christian religion. Uh, and crucifixion becomes... Um, the symbol of righteous suffering through which uh, a 20th century artist uh, would look at the events uh, of um, contemporary uh, time. Um, and uh, therefore, modern crucifixion was used for religious as well as for non-religious uh, purposes, uh, not anti-religious, but non-religious, definitely, because uh, some of the painters uh, that would uh, uh, make crucifixions in the 20th century would be Christian, uh, but some would not be Christian, some would be secular, and some would, would even be atheists, like, for example, Pablo Picasso. Um, so, uh, really, it's not about religion in the 20th century. It becomes more universal, and it becomes more about, again, righteous suffering, um, which, of course, um, speaks to the 20th century people. So we start with Expressionism. Expressionism uh, was uh, the first uh, 20th century movement. Um, started in the beginning of the 20th century, in the early 20th century. And Expressionism was of two kinds, French and German Expressionism. Now, if you are familiar with the history of 20th century painting, uh, you may remember now Henri Matisse and his famous Joie de Vivre, uh, Joy of Life. This is French Expressionism, and we will not need that because it's full of color, joy of life, and things like that. Um, this is not suitable for crucifixions, obviously, because crucifixions are about different kinds of emotions. So for crucifixions, German Expressionism was an ideal vehicle. 
um, because German Expressionism was about uh, negative feelings and emotions, uh, the feelings of sadness uh, and sorrow and uh, anxiety and depression and all those kind of things that uh, were uh, the, the best fit for uh, the crucifixion paintings. Now, this is just one example of German Expressionist crucifixion by Emil Nolde, made in 1912. It's a very famous painting. It was very controversial back, back in 1912. Um, German Expressionism um, was developed uh, um, in Germany, but it had two schools, uh, the so-called uh, Blue Rider uh, and um, the Dresden Group, the, the Bridge. So Blue Rider was more of an abstract kind of Expressionism, and uh, it was led by Kandinsky, the, uh, f the founder of abstraction. And the Dresden group were, were, was more of an expressionist kind. And Emil Nolde was a member was, uh, of the bridge in Dresden for less than a year. But still he is considered to be a, a part of that group. And he is probably the most famous painter of that group. Um, he's, uh, he was a very religious person himself. But his religiosity was not dogmatic. Um, he uh, uh, was familiar with the Bible. He read the Bible from, from his childhood. Um, but he was less familiar with Christian theology, and he thought that this helped him create uh, religious paintings that uh, transcend the boundaries of certain denominations or certain, certain Christian groups, uh, uh, paintings that uh, express uh, religious feelings uh, rather than a specific theology. And in this way, uh, Emil Nolde basically um, created this new type of crucifixion, a crucifixion that is not about uh, specific theology, but uh, it's about religious feelings, emotions, and even more so, uh, it's about, uh, again, right, the, the idea of righteous suffering that can be applied both to religious and secular world. So this painting was very controversial because of the way he portrayed Jesus, uh, completely non-canonical. Um, the faces of those people uh, are uh, full of uh, anger uh, and sadness and sorrow, etc., but not in the way uh, Christ and those who were witnesses to the crucifixion were portrayed before. Um, so he was criticized for this painting, but this painting stands as the prime example of what will uh, become the uh, typical uh, 20th century crucifixion. So here is another example of an expressionist crucifixion by George Rouault, um, a French painter, uh, a religious person uh, whose style is characterized by a mixture of expressionism and uh, primitivism. Uh, Rouault's crucifixions are uh, calmer, uh, less violent than Nolde's crucifixions because Nolde's style uh, was often characterized as hysterical mysticism. And uh, I think that is a good way to characterize it, hysterical mysticism. Uh, of course, this crucifixion is very different. Um, there is a sense of serenity, serenity here. Uh, and an interesting feature is that the hands of Christ um, are never ending, uh, which is symbolic of uh, you know, the belief that uh, you know, Christ saves everybody and everybody is invited. Now to the second uh, movement, Cubism. Have you seen this paint painting before by Picasso? Yeah, when we uh, uh, read about Picasso, we rarely see this painting. We all know that Picasso was an atheist. He was the member of the Communist Party. Uh, he made Guernica and you know, his er earlier uh, Cubist pieces, but we rarely see this piece. And this is his crucifixion made in 1930. Uh, and this is just uh, a couple of years be before he painted Guernica. And there is a deep connection between Guernica and this crucifixion. Um, just let me tell you a couple of words about uh, Cubism and Picasso. Cubism. <clears throat> was the second major innovation in Western painting uh, in the 20th century. Uh, Cubism was started by Picasso and Braque in Paris. Uh, and the main purpose of Cubism was to see uh, 
to see the way the painter uh, does uh, his painting in a different way, not visually, but conceptually. So uh, this dissection of the object into various pieces can be seen uh, as a, a, conceptual view, a conceptual view of the world. Uh, it was also described as a simultaneous perspective, you know, uh, as if we look at the object from all possible sides. Now, when you read uh, about cubism in art history books, you often read about cubism being um, a different style of painting, a stylistic phenomenon. And uh, Picasso himself, uh, when asked about uh, his painting, uh, he would usually reply that um, there is no connection between his personal ideology, his personal worldview, and his painting. He would say, yes, I'm a member of the Communist Party, but this has nothing to do with the way I paint. Uh, you know, the shoemakers make shoes. I'm a painter. I make paintings. Uh, and that's the way it is. So he was always avoiding um, the issue of the spiritual dimension of cubism, in other, in other words. And uh, again, when I teach cubism to my students, when I talk to uh, art history teachers, they usually talk about the stylistic phenomena, but nothing about the spiritual dimension uh, behind cubism. Uh, in my tradition... Uh, uh, the, the most famous 20th century Russian philosopher, Nicholas Berdyaev, uh, had a totally different view of cubism. When he went to see uh, the exhibition of cubist paintings in 1917, he was horrified uh, by this deconstruction, uh, dematerialization, dissection of the material world. And he wrote an article about that in which he said that uh, Picasso basically is a symptom of a deep crisis of culture. It's, it's, a, it's a decay of culture, it's a decay of spirituality, and Picasso is the great painter because he unmasks this, this crisis. Um, so I would subscribe to this understanding of cubism because often when you look at Picasso's portraits, they look like corpses, frankly. Um, now, why would he paint crucifixion? The question is, why would he do this? Um, why would he apply the cubist uh, technique to the subject of crucifixion. Um, now, when Picasso was making his crucifixion, he was influenced by surrealism. And um, in his crucifixion, he was trying to conflate uh, the themes of suffering and death and agony on the one hand, uh, and uh, the themes of uh, pagan rituals on the other hand. You know, this conflation of uh, human suffering and pagan religiosity would be one of the features of modern crucifixion. So uh, in this crucifixion, Picasso is interested in basically human violence, uh, human drive toward death. Uh, and uh, again, that would be uh, very characteristic of 20th century crucifixions that would focus uh, more not on the value of salvation and resurrection, but rather than death and dissipation. So here is the, con the basic connection. Uh, cubism and this idea of death and dissipation and uh, Christ's death and Christ's sufferings. Now, uh, generally speaking, uh, Picasso in his paintings wants to uh, come to the depth of things. So hence his conceptual view of the world rather than the visual view of the world. So when Picasso unmasks the world, unmasks the materiality of the world, he uh, comes to the skeleton of things. And in, in those skeleton of things, he sees uh, the chained uh, spirits of nature, the pagan gods. So... Here is the connection to the crucifixion. And uh, another interesting uh, thing is that uh, crucifixion predates uh, Picasso's Guernica, and Guernica was the premonition of the uh, Spanish Civil War. So there is a connection here as well. Uh, Picasso uh, senses something in the air. The, 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 um, he senses something horrible and, and devastating. And uh, he, first he paints crucifixion and then Guernica. Uh, so an interesting feature is that Christ is in white, and everything else is in color. Uh, here is another cubist uh, painting of crucifixion, very different, by Renato Guttuso. Um, 
arguably um, the greatest Italian artist of the 20th century, uh, fellow Cubist, a uh, very dear friend of Picasso, also the member of the Communist Party of Italy. Um, but there are differences between uh, Guttuso and Picasso. First of all, Guttuso um, was a social artist. Um, he uh, always uh, was saying that his art has some social purpose. Uh, unlike Picasso, who uh, always was trying to distance uh, himself from social ideologies. Uh, second, in his uh, painting style, Guttuso uses the so-called international cubism, which, is, uh, which means that his paintings are three-dimensional, not flat, uh, and he kind of dissects his objects uh, against the background of, of the three-dimensional world. Uh, this crucifixion is about um, the rise of uh, fascism, Nazism, and communism, and the um, uh, and the Europe that stands at the break uh, of the Second World War. So you see that Jesus is crucified between the two thieves, and one of the thieves is red, uh, which may be suggestive of, of communism, and the second one uh, may be suggesting of Nazism. Uh, the controversial uh, thing here is that uh, Mary Magdalene is naked, uh, and uh, Vatican was offended by that. Uh, and uh, the, the painting was very controversial. Actually, uh, let me tell you, uh, the painting was excluded from official exhibitions in Italy up until 1972. And just one more um, about Cubism. Um, actually, it's Cubo-Futurism. Jacques Villon, who was the brother of Marcel Duchamp, 20th century art icon, uh, also an artist. Uh, and he uses uh, cubist and futurist techniques. Uh, this is uh, a lithograph, uh, crucifixion. Now, futurism um, was another 20th century movement that was very close to cubism in terms of its style. Uh, the style is pretty much the same, but the intention is different. Cubism uh, was static, and its intention, intention was to uh, dissect the object. A futurism was dynamic, and its intention was to synthesize the beauty of the world. Uh, and, and the main purpose of futurism was to transmit the power of time in painting, so to, to, to kind of show, express the motion, the movement. So that's why futurist <coughs> paintings, although using the same cubist techniques, are much more dynamic and colorful and vibrant. Uh, so hence this crucifixion, um, which is done in the cubist technique, but uh, again, it's colorful, vibrant, and it's, uh, the colors suggest a resurrection rather than the crucifixion. The dissection of the object suggests the uh, crucifixion, but the colors and the overall dynamism suggests, suggests resurrection. Now, moving on to uh, surrealism. Surrealism was uh, the main... Uh, art movement in the 20th century between the wars, between the First and the Second World War. And surrealism, uh, as you may know, was invented by uh, André Breton, uh, who was inspired by Sigmund Freud. Uh, the main purpose of surrealism was to um, express uh, the power of human uh, subconscious. Uh, and the way to do it, they thought, would be uh, to bypass reason to bypass morality, to bypass any aesthetic consideration. So uh, as such, uh, surrealism seems like a very irrationalist movement, which it was. Uh, and uh, therefore, it was not uh, close to religion. Surrealists were uh, communists. André Breton was communist. He uh, published his first surrealist manifesto um, in his own surrealist magazine. But later, he joined this magazine with the um, with the communist newspaper in France. So they flirted with communism. <clears throat> in the end, <clears throat> they found out that um, uh, communism is not for them. But they flirted with it for, for a while. They also flirted with Eastern religions, uh, with the religions like Buddhism, with New Age movement, with uh, different kind of alternative spiritualities. So there, were, there was some religious or kind of spiritualist flavor in surrealism. But surrealism overall did not produce a lot of crucifixions. I will show you just uh, a couple of examples 
the first one comes from Salvador Dali, uh, who, of course, is considered to be the surrealist par excellence, um, but who painted his crucifixions when he was not already a member of the movement. In the second part of his life, uh, he moved back to religion uh, of his youth, to Catholicism, and he uh, has done a series of religious paintings, uh, crucifixions, just uh, uh, one of the examples. Um, Salvador Dali was not a surrealist um, in the way Breton was. Andre Breton preached that um, when creating art, uh, human mind should be passive so that uh, we encounter our subconscious and we kind of relate it to the art. Uh, and uh, Salvador Dali, from the beginning of his career, uh, insisted that our mind is uh, active and we create ourselves the world in which we live. Hence, he called his uh, uh, style a paranoic critical activity. And later in his life, he uh, rediscovered science. Uh, he was fascinated by nuclear physics. And he thought that um, when humans penetrate the depth of this world, they would find um, something that is spiritual and religious. So this is his idea behind his crucifixions. If Picasso, when he unmasks the world, what he finds is chaos. When Salvador Dali uh, unmasks the materiality of the world, he finds some subatomic particles which uh, he thought were angels. Uh, and Jesus is that ultimate reality that holds the whole world together. Uh, so that is Dali's crucifixion. Uh, and uh, these are just two examples. This is the first one, and this is the, the, the second one. The second one probably being even more famous, uh, Corpus Hypercubus. And the second uh, surrealist examples come from, uh, comes from Marc, Marc Chagall. Uh, Marc Chagall was not a surrealist painter, uh, formally speaking. He was not a member of the group, um, but Breton, uh, when he reviewed his paintings, uh, thought of him as one of their own. Um, Chagall's style is um, influenced by primitivism, by cubism, by surrealism, uh, and the overall dreamlike atmosphere of his paintings, uh, you know, made Breton suggest that Chagall is one of their own. Although Chagall himself uh, told uh, one of his interviewers that he always slept well without Freud. So formally, he was not a surrealist. Now, what, what's interesting in Chagall's crucifixion is that this is the first uh, painting made by a Jew of Christ. Uh, Chagall was a Jew, a Hasidic Jew. He grew up in, a, in an Orthodox Jewish family. He had problems with becoming a painter, actually, because it, was, it is forbidden in uh, ultra-Orthodox environment to uh, be engaged in those kind of activities. Um, but in, in most of his paintings, uh, for one church there will be one synagogue, uh, and for some Christians there will be some Jews. So he portrays basically Jesus as the Jew par excellence. Uh, so that's why we see Jesus as a Jew here uh, with, you know, with the, the, those typical Jewish elements on the cross. And um, here we see um, the Jews who are trying to save themselves from pogroms, who are being persecuted, who are, you know, emigrate to other countries, etc. All those horrors of the Jews in the 20th century are focused in the figure of Jesus. So that, that is an interesting uh, perspective. Now, moving on to abstract expressionism. Where are we? Okay. So, moving on to abstract expressionism. Barnett Newman. Um, let me see. Abstraction was probably one of the most significant innovations in 20th century painting uh, because it broke uh, not only with 500 years of tradition of representation like Cubism did, but for the first time in, in Western art, uh, it created a completely non-representational art. Uh, abstraction... Um, came in two waves. The first wave, represented by Kandinsky, uh, 
uh, and others um, before and after the First World War, and the second wave here in the United States after the Second World War. So I will be giving examples from the second wave, uh, abstract expressionism, which is different from the first wave um, because it um, also incorporates some uh, influences from surrealism. Abstract expressionism basically is a combination of abstraction and surrealism. But unlike um, classical surrealism, abstract expressionists were more interested in Carl Gustav Jung rather than Sigmund Freud. And Carl Gustav Jung, who was a uh, disciple of Freud and uh, a collaborator, co-founder of psychoanalysis, had a very different idea about human subconscious. According to Jung, human subconscious uh, is collective. We share a certain level of uh, subconscious uh, mind, and in this unconscious or subconscious um, level of our human uh, mind, um, the so-called archetypes are stored, the basic ideas which find their way, the, which are manifested in uh, art. And that's how Jung explained uh, the similarity in uh, uh, art um, in different times and history, uh, cultures and civilizations, etc. So abstract expressionists, when they create their abstract compositions, they are trying to um, express not only, uh, well, not so much individual subconscious with sexual urges and violence, but rather this collective level of subconscious which is um, more mythological uh, and more peaceful. Because the main idea of Jung uh, was that in order to um, uh, not to have problems with mental health using you know, uh, the way psychologists talk now. Um, if you do not want to have problems with mental health, you should find a healthy balance between the, what's inside you and what's outside you. So by producing art, an artist is trying to find this balance. Uh, so abstract expressionism it's about, is about the mythological dimension uh, of things, and in this case, of crucifixion. So uh, this particular example is more abstract than expressionist. Uh, the next one is more expressionist than abstract. Uh, and um, we move here to Europe. Francis uh, Bacon uh, is an English painter uh, whose works represent uh, a European version of post-war uh, abstract expressionism. Again, more expressionist than abstract. Um, I would personally say that Bacon is, um, in a way, a disciple of Picasso. He develops the themes of Picasso, but he applies um, those themes uh, to post-war Europe uh, and to the situation in post-war Europe, and uh, he applies it to his own style of abstract expressionism. But like in Picasso's crucifixion, uh, Bacon's crucifixions are not about Christ, are not about resurrection. They are about suffering, death, inhumanity, and basically they evoke the images of slaughterhouses. So in Bacon's crucifixions, uh, we see the inevitability of death, the inhumanity of man, and those figures, uh, you know, those hor horrifying, I would say, figures, um, uh, he, are uh, not divine. They are half human, half animal. Again, I, th I, I see the traces of Picasso here, you know, from Picasso to Bacon, likewise from Kafka to Samuel Beckett, waiting for Godot, if you make some parallels between uh, painting and literature. And if you make another parallel with music, um, let's say from Stravinsky, uh, who is a modern composer, but still has something, some kind of uh, um, flavor of classical music to Schoenberg, uh, to complete deconstruction in music, uh, to music as silence and things like that. But not all abstract expressionists uh, are um, uh, producing paint paintings of that kind. So here is a, a, a pretty, pretty typical classical uh, crucifixion by Graham Sutherland, another English painter. 
uh, and this is his famous crucifixion, which is uh, done in the, in, the, in the same style, but uh, classical, religious, um, and not controversial. Just one more. Look at this. Antonio Saura. This is a Spanish, Spanish, famous, quite famous Spanish artist of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, he is a surrealist and ab abstract expressionist, so this is one of his crucifixions. Um, and in this crucifixion, uh, the image of Christ is completely um, dissolved into something that is uh, chaotic. Uh, Saura, like um, Picasso, uh, like so many of 20th century artists, is interested in um, suffering and violence in that aspect of crucifixion and addresses this in his paintings. Now, uh, the last uh, 20th century art movement uh, that I would like to uh, talk about is postmodernism. Um, so what is postmodernism? As um, the word suggests, it's something that comes after modernism. Uh, but what is modernism? Modernism uh, is an ideology that is based on science and human rationality. Uh, so postmodernism seems to be a continuation of that. Uh, however, postmodernists, in my view, are not different from modernists. They just continue uh, the ideology of modernism by extending it uh, to other extremes. So here is, here is the thing. In modernism, um, people still have some kind of absolute, and this absolute is science. Science is considered to be something uh, that uh, should not be questioned, that should have authority over all people, uh, if it is real science, of course. So uh, modernity and modernism question religion uh, as something that cannot be verified objectively, but still retain science as an objective authority. Postmodernists go even further and deconstruct science as one of the absolutes. So the main idea of, mo of postmodernism is the deconstruction of all absolutes, including religion, science, and anything else. Um, in the language of postmodernism, this is called uh, delegitimation of knowledge, and they describe those uh, various ways of uh, uh, dealing with reality as different language games. So science is one language game, religion is another language game, magic is another language game, etc. Uh, but the main, the main point of postmodernism is that all those language, language games are equal. And therefore, no, no language game uh, should be given preference. So hence, religions, religion comes back, but not as the religion, but as one of the language games. And so are others. So, um, the two main features of postmodern art are um, the coming back of figuration, uh, because abstraction is just one of the artistic language games, and figuration may come back. And the second feature of postmodern art is the so-called minority art, because minorities are usually oppressed by the majority who pretend that their absolute, their narrative is uh, dominant and therefore should be um, respected by everybody, but uh, according to postmodernism, every narrative has its own uh, legitimation or legitimacy. So therefore, postmodern artists focus in their art on something that was oppressed, repressed, you know, um, forgotten, uh, hence the minority art. So here are some examples of crucifixion uh, in, uh, in postmodern art. Now this is... Um, a rare, rare example of a crucifixion in pop art. You know, pop art can be seen as the revival of figuration and therefore the beginning of postmodernism. But pop art is so different from the um, theme of crucifixion because pop art was about the glorification of popular culture, commercialism, video, advertisement, etc. Pop art has uh, an ironic qualities and take it easy attitude so uh, not compatible with uh, crucifixion. So you won't find uh, uh, many crucifixions in pop art. This is just one of them. And uh, still here, uh, it has an ironic quality. It's kind of a parody, 
on the depiction of crucifixion in Western culture. Now, as for the minority art, you, we can find a lot of crucifixions here. So this is just one of the examples by an American uh, painter, William Johnson. Um, this is an example of an uh, African-American crucifixion, Afro-American crucifixion. Johnson um, was trying to conflate primitivism with postmodernism, with postmodern art. For him, primitivism or Africanness uh, means purity and depth. Um, so he portrays his Jesus as a black person, symbolic of you know um, Jesus being uh, closer to the roots of spirituality. For Johnson, uh, primitivism and spirituality is pretty much the same. Um, so here is one example, and uh, another example of the same kind. Um, uh, black Messiah uh, in those postmodern paintings. Uh, during the social uh, unrest in America in the 60s uh, would um, be replaced by Brother Jesus, Jesus who is seen as the friend of all uh, the oppressed people. Um, and here just another example of that kind of attitude. Francis Sousa, an Indian, paper, uh, Indian painter, so, sorry, Indian painter, uh, who paints Jesus as an African or tribal uh, mask. And finally, a contemporary American artist, probably the most popular, commercially speaking, artist in the United States, uh, Julian Schnabel, uh, a postmodern artist, and this is an example of a feminist crucifixion in which uh, Jesus is depicted as a woman. Uh, another uh, way of creating a minority act. So Jesus is conflated with all people who are oppressed, basically. So let me conclude uh, my brief presentation with this crucifixion by an Australian painter, Arthur Boyd. Uh, it's called Crucifixion and Rose, uh, and I think it's very important in terms of my thesis. Um, here Jesus is portrayed against the uh, background of an Australian landscape. And uh, the rose is of most importance in this painting. The rose may symbolize various things, purity, uh, celestial qualities, uh, but in this particular painting, uh, virginity, uh, but in this particular painting, rose is a symbol of uh, the English culture, or more generally, the culture of the Enlightenment, or modernity. <laughs> there is a tension between modernity and traditional cultures. And what Boyd is trying to say with, with this painting is that this rose does not take roots, it floats. But when the rose takes roots, it destroys. So there is this um, unending tension between uh, the rationalist and secular ideology of modernity and traditional cultures that are based on religion. Um, and I think this is the key to understanding uh, the transformation uh, the cru uh, which the crucifixion uh, underwent in the 20th century. 20th century crucifixions or modern crucifixions uh, usually depict this tension between modernity and traditional cultures. Uh, they depict the modern attitude toward culture. That's why they uh, usually center on uh, suffering and death rather than resurrection um, and ascension. So in this crucifixion, we are facing the question of the tension between modernity and tradition. And this is the main, uh, I think, the main content um, of 20th century crucifixions. Just one more. You see these hands? And remember Grunewald? <laughs> so the common denominator of all the 20th century crucifixions is this transformation of crucifixion from a purely religious event with dogmatic and theological implications to a basic cultural archetype of righteous suffering. And as such, uh, the crucifixion serves uh, various purposes for various painters. 
It can be a traditional religious uh, purpose, or it can be a social message, or it can be a, a, an existential message, uh, etc., etc., etc. As, as such, it becomes a perfect vehicle to express the existential and social realities of the 20th century history. So that's how Christ was crucified again and again on the canvases of those painters who have brought a new dimension and modern perspective to the death of the Savior that took place 2,000 years ago in the dark corner of the Roman Empire. Thank you.